What's up Shucks and welcome back to another video and today as you saw by the title and that obvious thumbnail today we're going to be breaking down episode one of the Chucky TV series titled Death by Misadventure. First things first, before we get into this breakdown, if you have not seen the episode and you do not want to be spoiled, then this is not the video for you. I highly recommend that you click off this video and go watch the first full episode on the Sci-Fi YouTube channel or the USA Network YouTube channel because they uploaded the full episode on both channels. So I highly recommend that you go watch those first, which I will be linking down in the description below, and then come back to this video. So I think that's pretty much all I have to say. We're going to break down the episode and then at the end, I'm going to give my thoughts and opinions. So without further ado, let's dive right in. All right, so the episode starts off with a grainy piece of footage of a woman combing her hair in a mirror, which we later find out at the end of the episode is a flashback of Charles E. Ray when he was younger, along with his mother. We then move on to the yard sale scene where Jake buys Chucky for only $10. Oh, he is so lucky. And if you notice, a lady in a red coat walks right past the screen. Well, they showed some behind the scenes right after this episode aired, and Don Mancini, the creator of Chucky, reveals that that was supposed to be Tiffany. Starting in episode one, the yard sale, where Jake buys Chucky. If you look closely, you can see a mysterious woman in a red coat and scarf walk by. That is meant to be Tiffany, of course. It's a coat that we see her wear later in the season. It then cuts to a shot of Jake walking home while listening to Devin Lopez's podcast called The Hack and Slash because it was revealed a while back that the character of Devin Lopez was gonna have a podcast where he talks about horror and everything murderous that goes down in the city of Hackensack. Now, I'm not sure if you would count this as an Easter egg or not, but if you look at the picture on Jake's phone in the corner, it says new hacks every Tuesday. So that means he uploads a new podcast every Tuesday. So do you think that might correlate with the fact that the show itself has a new episode every Tuesday? I mean, I might be looking too deeply into it, but with this stuff, you'll never know. Devin then talks about how the murders in Hackensack have risen and that they haven't been that high since the Ray family murders of 1965. So judging by the way he made that sound, maybe Charles Ray was born into a family of murderers and that's how he became a murderer himself. After the podcast ends, we then get a little look at what Jake's home life is like. And my gosh, it is awful. Mainly because of his abusive alcoholic father. Now we'll get to why he's abusive later on in the video. We then get introduced to his cat named Binks. I know it's short for something longer. I forgot what the cat's full name is, but his nickname is Binks, which might be a callback. I mean, I know this has nothing to do with Chucky, but it might be a callback to the movie Hocus Pocus because the cat in that movie was named Binks as well, which might tie in with Tony Gardner, who also worked on the set of this series. He worked on the set of this series and he worked on the set of Hocus Pocus. In this scene, when Jake is talking to his dad, Lucas, about his doll statue, he reveals that his love for art comes from following the footsteps of his mother, who we later find out passed away in a car accident. Jake's father then expresses his disapproval of his art by saying he spends too much time on it. We then move on to this extremely awkward dinner scene between Jake and his father and Logan's side of the family, because in case you didn't know, Jake's father, Lucas, has a twin brother named Logan, who are both played by Devin Sawa. And on Logan's side of the family, he has his wife, Bree, who was played by Lexa Doige, I hope I pronounced that right, and their son, who is Jake's cousin, Junior Wheeler, who was played by Tio Briones. Throughout this entire dinner scene, Junior is making fun of the fact that Jake is gay, because in case you didn't know, our main protagonist, Jake Wheeler, is gay. And if you have a problem with that, then you can go ahead and exit the video. Anyways, like I was saying, throughout this entire dinner scene, Junior is making fun of Jake for being gay. And Jake's father, Lucas, expresses his disapproval of it by classifying it as he doesn't know what he wants because he's 13. Jake then corrects him and says he's 14, which goes to show that he is a terrible father if he doesn't know how old his own son is. Junior's mom, Bree, then goes to use the bathroom, which we then find out she's just going in another room to take a phone call that she wants no one to hear. We know that because when Chucky scatters around in the closet, she opens it thinking it's just a doll. And then she says, oh, I thought someone was in here with me. And while she's on the phone, she also continues to say, I really need to see you. So maybe she might be having an affair of some sort or something much worse. Jake then says goodbye to Junior by flipping the bird at him. Then we hear the sound of something getting destroyed. Jake rushes to his room and come to find out it's his father destroying his doll statue that we know it took him weeks, maybe even months to work on. He then goes on to say no more dolls ever. Then to continue on with this emotional scene, Jake starts crying while a song called This Is How Villains Are Made starts to play in the background. Then to make matters worse, when he looks under the bed, he finds out Chucky is there along with a piece of his cat Binks. 
I mean, to be honest with you, the second I saw that cat, I had a feeling something was going to happen to it. A slight bit of criticism that I have is I find it kind of weird how they just glossed over the cat's death because the cat wasn't mentioned ever again until the end of the episode. Then the morning after that, we see Jake browsing the internet trying to find out how much the good guy doll is worth. Then a bunch of eBay listings and stuff pops up showing the doll is worth over $1,000, which is very accurate. So Jake then decides to take Chucky to school with him to keep him from getting destroyed. We then find out that Jake's school life is no better than his home life because he instantly starts getting bullied the second he steps foot on the bus. Which could or couldn't be a reference to Andy getting bullied in Child's Play 2 when he got on the bus. Another thing that I find weird is how Junior treats Jake like crap outside of school, but within school, whenever he sees somebody like his girlfriend Lexi bullying Jake, he's like, lay it off, give him a break. I'm like, nah, don't switch up now, Junior. Then right after the frog scene that we saw a few weeks before the episode premiered, Jake then gives the doll to the teacher to put away because he can't fit it in his locker. Then right after that, we go on to a scene that takes place during lunch, which if you look there, you'll see Jake eating a thing of chili. Now you may be wondering why I'm acknowledging that. Well, if you go back to Curse of Chucky, it's basically become like a Easter egg or a tradition for every bit of Chucky media to have somebody eating chili in a glass bowl. We saw it in Curse, we saw it in Cult, and now we're seeing it in the TV series. We then see an adorable interaction between Jake and his crush Devin, until Devin ultimately ruins it by asking Jake to be a part of his podcast about bullying. That then causes Jake to take it as, oh, so you think I'm the poster boy for losers? Then he storms off. Come on, Devin, everything was going so good, you just had to ruin it. Moving on, Jake then gets a message from someone interested in purchasing his doll and wants to chat with him about it. So when he calls the number, we move on to the scene that we already saw in the trailer where it's Andy warning him about the doll and telling him to check the batteries. So he takes his advice and then checks the batteries and the second that he notices that there's no batteries in the doll, does he drop it under the couch? No, instead he rushes outside and throws it in the trash. Oh yeah, because in case you don't remember, earlier I said the teacher put Chucky in a locker, but somehow he broke out which is how he ended up back at Jake's house. We then move on to my favorite scene in this entire episode, the ventriloquist talent show scene. So the school is having a talent show and the scene starts off with Devin Lopez playing the piano. After he's done, Lexi Taylor walks onto the stage because she's the host of the talent show. She then acknowledges her parents in the audience, which we then find out that her father is the same actor that played Dr. Foley in Cult of Chucky. Lexi then decides to point Jake out in the audience being the jerk that she is and tries to out him in front of Devin and his mom. But before she has the chance to do that, Chucky interrupts her and pops up behind Jake, which I think is one of the coolest shots in this episode. Jake then picks up Chucky and Chucky starts whispering in Jake's ear and I wasn't able to tell what he was saying, but it sounds like he was saying something along the lines of do exactly what I say. When Jake brings Chucky on stage, he then airs all of Lexi's dirty laundry, which is rightfully deserved. We find out that she's Botox curious. We find out that she's Googling Pokemon doing the nasty. And then we then find out that she's also Googling why my farts smell so good, which I think is freaking hilarious. And she deserved every bit of it. And we also find out that she's cheating on Junior with Oliver. You know, the bully that knocked Jake down in the classroom. Chucky then starts cussing up a storm and then gets him and Jake kicked off the stage by the school administrators. After that, we move on to a scene of Lucas yelling at Jake for making fun of his family and friends, which we obviously know wasn't his fault. Jake then asserts his sexuality to his father. If you don't know what assert means, it pretty much means to force something upon someone. And as we all know, Jake's father, Lucas, refuses to accept the fact that Jake is gay. You know what happens next. And if there's any moment in this entire episode where I wanted someone to die, it was this moment. Because nobody should have to go through something like this because of who they love. Because of that, Jake then says that it should have been him in the car instead of his mom. Because like I said earlier, his mom passed away in a car accident. So Jake then says that it should have been Lucas in the car instead of his mom. Lucas then sends Jake up to his room and then when he sits down, he realizes that the full bottle of whiskey that he had on the table is now empty. Lucas then goes to check the breaker, and then when he does, he finds out what happened to all his whiskey. And by the way, I'm not the only person who thought that this death was similar to Jill's death from Curse of Chucky. Both had some kind of liquid poured onto their feet while they were near something electrical, and then they both got their right eyes burned out. I guess you can say those were some shocking deaths. No? I'll see myself out. Shortly after all that goes down, Jake gets interrogated by Devin's mom, who just so happens to be a detective. But of course, he doesn't admit to anything out of fear of what Chucky might do. So after that, we find out that Jake is going to be staying with Logan's side of the family from now on. And judging by Junior's face, it does not look like he's too happy about this. 
By the way, I would like to point out this scene transition. That same exact scene transition was used in Colt right here. That then leads to a scene when Chucky finally reveals himself to Jake because up to this point, Jake has not seen Chucky alive. I mean, you can count the ventriloquist scene, but I don't count that because Chucky was still technically in his good guy form. So in a way, this is Chucky's first time revealing his true self to Jake. And I love the reference that they made at the beginning of this scene when Jake is holding up Chucky and he's like, talk to me, damn it, which is obviously a callback to the first movie. But before Jake is able to finish the rest of Karen's line from the first movie, Chucky stops him in his tracks and smacks him across the face, which I think is one of the most hilarious things I have ever seen. Chucky's like, no, I refuse to get threatened to get thrown into a fireplace again. And the episode ends with a flashback from Charles e. Ray's childhood. Pretty much getting us excited to go more in depth on Charles e. Ray's life and how he became a serial killer. So yeah, that just about wraps it up for this breakdown. In my opinion, I think this was the perfect episode and it was the perfect way to start off the series. I would give this episode a 4 out of 5 only because there was a few little nitpicks that I had, like how quickly they glossed over the cat's death and why Junior treats Jake so differently within school and outside of school. And the fact that it was too short because I wanted more. I mean, I know it's a TV series, but come on. Besides those few little nitpicks, I give it a 4 out of 5. It was a very fun watch and I highly recommend that you guys should watch it. But those are just my thoughts. Make sure you leave your thoughts down in the comment section below. Let me know what you liked about the episode. Let me know what you didn't like. And even let me know your rating. And as always, like, comment, subscribe, share, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at CheckyFan101. And frame me on Facebook at IkeCheckyFan. That's I-K-E CheckyFan. And as the text says on the screen right now, all the links will be in the description below, including the link to the first episode on both the Sci-Fi YouTube channel and the USA Network channel in case you want to watch it yourself. Goodbye and have a Checkified day.